Uh, hi friends, uh, welcome to the quick review of uh, 8086 and uh, microprocessors and microcontrollers course. So we'll have a, a quick review about the whole syllabus like CO1, CO2, CO3, CO4 and the aspects that we are going to cover uh, in a quick format. We'll start with uh, 8086 microprocessor. So basically microprocessor is a, is a component in a bigger computer, any computer is categorized into three uh, three categories. One is your CPU, other are your memories, and the rest of them are your input outputs. All these three components are integrated by a thing called a bus. Uh, ideally, uh, you have learned that a bus is categorized into address bus, data bus and a control bus so address bus is the one which carries your address or which picks the location either in the memory or in the input outputs the data bus carries the data to and fro from either memories or ios and the control bus will decide whether you want to read or a write so the direction of the data bus is controlled by the control bus so this is the basic architecture of any computer and you consider any components of the computer they fall either under the memories or IOS or the processing units. So we'll start with one such microprocessor unit which, uh, which is a primitive processor that is 8086. So 8086 processor will start with the features of 8086. Any processor will have a couple of features like the ALU, the address bus width, the data bus width. 8086 starts as a 16-bit processor. So 16-bit processor in the sense the arithmetic or the logical operations that we do are a width of 16 bits. And uh, the ALU is always linked with the data bus because if we are trying to process 16 bits of data suppose you want to do an addition so we'll do a 16 bit addition plus a 16 bit addition so our data sizes are always maximum of 16 bits that is where you get in the data of 16 bits so ideally the alu and the data bus will always be in sync so whenever you want to add a 16 bit number you always get a 16 bit number and then you store in the you store them in the registers coming to the address bus so address bus is one specific thing of your 8086 8086 address bus is 20 bits address bus is no way related to the data bus uh, to be specific address bus points out the location in the memory whereas data bus carries the data from the memory so ideally address bus will tell you how much space that you can access and data bus will allow us to pick the data from there here a uh, couple of key things that we have to remember is one address location will hold one byte of data so this is one standard form that we have to know because whenever we are going to pick a data from an address hardly, hardly you will find one byte at every address so if at all we want to pick 16 bits of data uh, that means which is equivalent to two bytes so we have to travel two different addresses so your data bus spreads across two different uh, two different addresses and gets in the data for us so either if i'm adding a 8-bit data you're going to one address if you are adding a 16-bit data i'm going to two different addresses if i'm bringing a 32-bit data that means i'm going to four different addresses that is a address and data thing now how this address bus will tell what is the memory that i can access so if there is one location there will be two possibilities either 0 or 1 if I say there are two different two bits to address the locations I have four different addresses I can have 0 0 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 likewise 3 is 8 4 is 16 so 2 power so 20 bit address will tell that I can access how many locations is 2 power 20 locations so 2 power 20 locations are 
can be addressed by your 8086 processor. So what is the data available at each location? Each location is we call it an address. We have one byte of data which sums around 2 power 20 bytes of memory. So which is something equivalent to 1 MB. So how much address, how much data 80 can maximum address is 1 MB. So that is the maximum memory you can actually have. So you, we usually see this uh, when you are using your mobile phone or something. Your pen drives or uh, your SD cards in your mobile phones are expandable up to 32 GB or expandable up to 64 GB. So why do we get this limitation? Is because of this address bus. So that means if I have a 10 bit address bus, I'll have 2 per 10 bytes. If I have a 30 bit address bus, it is as simple as 2 per 30 bytes. So this comes uh, across the whole uh, course. So whenever we find n bit of address bus, we'll have 2 per n locations of data and 2 per n bytes of memory. So that is how you figure out what is the maximum memory we can access. Uh, so one more feature that got added is we have 1 MB of memory and like I said any CPU uh, will have an address bus, data bus so we go out and bring in the data. So soon after we bring in the data we need to have a storage location to store the data and they will be the registers. So what should be the size of the register? You should always sync up with the size of your data ideally because or your ALU because uh, we get a 16 bit data we need to accommodate a space to store in the 16 bits of data and again send it to the ALU for it to add. So your registers are again 16 bits. So that is how the whole operation of the CPU is going to work. So there are a couple of features uh, we'll, we'll get into that in the later stages. Now the data bus, the data is always fitting in the registers and are transferred to ALU to do the addition part. The problem is with the address bus. The size of our address bus is 20 bits. That means uh, in order to store the address, I require 20 bits of address space, which is not available within my registers. So to solve this problem, uh, there is a logical way that we can do is, that is what we call segmentation. So in order to address the problem where the address bus requires only 20 bits of space, where our CPU cannot accommodate the 20 bits, we go into a logical way that we call segmentation. Segmentation is nothing but dividing the whole memory into parts. So are they physical? No, they are purely logical. So it is a way we see them as a segment. Likewise, we have a 20 bit of address space. But the register size is 16 bits. So we have to eradicate maybe the 4 bits, 4 excess bits. So eradicating the 4 excess bits will shift the whole thing 4 times towards the, towards the right. Which ends up division of 2 power 16. Sorry, 2 power 4. So what happens when you, uh, this is one important part, whenever you shift left, whenever you shift left by 2, you are dividing by 2. Whenever you are shifting right, you are multiplying by 2 because the place value of any uh, binary is power of 2's. So if I shift left by 2 parts, you are actually multiplying by uh, Hey, I'm sorry, I think we have to redo this part again. Uh, the part, whenever you shift right by 2, you are actually dividing by 2. And whenever you are shifting left by 2, you are actually multiplying by 2. Uh, that is what, that is what we will try to apply here. So 16 bits, I have to make it a 16 bit. Uh, 20 bits, I have to make it a 16 bit. So what I will do, I have to shift right by uh, maybe 4 times. So which end up 2 power 4. So I am breaking the whole memory into 16 parts. So 16 parts of what size is? 16 parts of 2 power 16 each. So which is equivalent to 64 KB. Which ends up a new feature. We have 16 segments 
and the size of each segment is 64 kb so how we arrived to this is we we have divided the whole thing to fit into our memory space so the, this part is called as a segmentation so this is one crucial part of any processor that we come across because uh, this unless we have a segmentation there is no way we can fit the data into our registers now now comes the the part how you will calculate the address so now we spoke about two things one is called as a physical and other is called as a logical the physical space is a 20 bit whereas logical space we are telling that we have 16 segments of 64k each so how do you address this problem so whenever you are actually going to memory your address space is 20 bits so your 16 bits addresses are to be converted to 20 addresses so what happens in this conversion is we require two different registers to store so one for holding the segment name and for another one storing the local address which we call a base address and a logical address base address and a offset address so these are the two two logical addresses that we get out of something called as a segmentation which gets combined to something called as a physical address so how do you we usually do this how do we arrived physical address to a logical addresses we divided them into 16 parts so how do i convert the logical address to physical address back is multiply by the same 16 parts so the conversion formula would be like this so the base address into uh, 16 number of segments plus offset address like i said whenever you are multiplying by 2 you are shifting right by 2 so how much i am multiplying with you are multiplying with 2 power 4 so how many bits you are actually trying to shift you are trying to shift 4 bits that means a 16 bit address is converted to a 20 bit address so this is one important uh, uh, formula or the method that we we come across all the time in the rest of the course and there are a couple of problems that you uh, will encounter that you need to solve so how do we uh, I'll, I'll maybe i'll start with the simple example problem let's say the physical address is one two three four sorry the base address is one two three four h and the offset address is five six seven eight h how do i get the physical addresses base address into 16 plus 5, 6, 7, 8, H. So, this is ideally 16 D, 16 segments is 16 decimals. So, to convert into hexadecimal, this will be 10 H. And by shifting the position, you are actually doing 1, 2, 3, 4, 0 plus 5, 6, 7, 8. So, you never need to worry about the addition part. All you have to do is the base address followed by 0 and add the offset address. You will end up having a total physical address of 20 bits so this is this is how the segmentation works and uh, like i said how many total segments we have are we have total of 16 segments 16 do we need to have all the 16 segments maybe yes maybe no they are purely logical so how do you end up uh, creating these segments and how many kinds of segments do we have with the 806 there are four categories of segments so namely uh, the, the categories are divided based on the usage of that segment so 16 segments i can have and I, every segment i can use it for its own purpose ideally we write a code and code has some data in it and we require some stack part in it the the segments are divided into data uh, we'll start with code we have a code segment data segment extra segment and a stack segment so these are the four
types of segments we can have and total segments that you can have is 16. Maybe I can have a program uh, having a 15 code segments and one data segment or 14 code segments, one data segment and one stack segment. So all in all, I can extend up to 16. So every segment will have a unique address called as a base address. Every segment have a local address called as a offset address. Now to fix, uh, in order to address all the components of your memory, there are registers which are predefined which will help us figure out the address. There are addresses called as segment registers. What does these segment registers do? Segment registers will point the starting address of every segment. So how many such starting addresses I can have are depending on the number of segments. So if I have four segments, I'll have four. If I have eight segments, I'll have eight. So maybe the re register which can hold the base address of a code segment is CS. The data segment base address is DS. Extra segment base address is ES. And stack segment base address is SS. And what are the sizes of every register? Every register is a 16 bit of width. And uh, these are the things which will uh, store the addresses that are required for us. And then comes the offset addresses. To hold the offset addresses, what kind of registers we have? So to hold the offset of uh, a code, we have something called a instruction pointer. So we have a register called IP. IP holds the address of the next instruction to be executed. So what does a code do? Code will execute the se uh, sequence of instructions. So after instruction 1, you have to go to 2. After 2, you have to go to 3. So every time uh, we go into uh, the next instruction, we have to figure out what is the next address we have to go to. Now we will come into the offset registers of H086. As there are four segments and we had four base address registers covered, every segment will have a respective offset. So one such offset is a IP. IP is an instruction pointer. Instruction pointer will point to the address location where the next instruction is being executed. And uh, data segment has an offset which is SI. SI is called as a source index. So data segment is where we usually store the data. Extra segment is where you preferably store the outputs. So DI points your extra segment. Similarly stack segment is pointed by SS as a base. Similarly the offset will be SP. Stack pointer is a register which will point on the always on the top of the stack. That means the stack grows downwards every time you make a push and upwards whenever you make a pop. And there is also one more register which will point the stack which is a base pointer. So these are all the set of registers which will which are in 8086. So if we consolidate all the registers, the segment registers will be CS, DS, ES and SS. These are the four registers which, are, which points the base address of every segment. And offset address we have various categories. One are pointers. We have uh, SP, stack pointer and a base pointer. We have index registers which is a source index and a destination index. Along with that, we have an instruction pointer and lastly, we have a flag register. So these are the registers which will address the base and offset address of, of 806. So through these registers, we will generate the physical address. And as we already discussed, physical address generation formula is base address into 10 or 16D plus offset address. So a base address in combination with these, either of these will form a physical address and then go get the code or a data from your memories. So this part is called as a segmentation. From segmentation, we, uh, we come into something called as a registers. Now uh, the point is we, we are using these segments which are available in the memories to bring in the data. So the data can be either an address or a data or a command 
so whenever we get the data we need some internal storage to store these data values for that we come uh, we use something called as a general purpose registers so there are a bunch of general purpose registers which need, which are storing the data that is bought from the memory one is ax bx cx and dx so ax is an accumulator bx is a base register cx is used for count and dx is a destination register these are the special functions of these registers and all these registers are basically 16 bits they can also act like a two 8 bit registers ax acts as ah and AL. so these 8 bits and these another 8 bits which combinedly can be addressed as a 16 bit so 8086 allows us to either to get a 8 bit data fetch an 8 bit data or a 16 bit data suppose if I fetch 8 bit data i'll store it in al or ah or bl or bh cl or ch dl or dh if at all a 16 bit data i can use these set of registers these are all the general purpose registers which are in handy so that uh, i can use them to store in my data which is accessible for my program this these are the bunch of uh, registers that are available in 8086 now as we discussed from these registers we are going to get the data so there is a concept of pipelining so what does a pipeline do is in an execution process uh, involves a lot of steps if we parallelize the execution process we usually call it pipelining so it involves fetch decode and execute in 8086 we don't have a separate decode and execute which is combinedly we call it a execute so we have a two stage pipeline where all the operations fall under these two so the fetch part is done by something called a bus interface unit the execute part is done by something called as a execution unit so arranging all the registers and the components in the respective parts will form the architecture of 8086 so let us quickly look at the architecture so this forms the architecture of uh, 8086 microcontroller so like i said we have a bus interface unit and an execution unit the upper part is the bus interface unit and lower part is the execution unit so to simply uh, the easiest way of understanding the architecture would be bus interface unit is always going and getting the data from the memory so what involves going and getting the data we have bunch of registers to address the data we have a base address and an offset address all the base address registers cs ds es ss are available in the biu and uh, the, the physical address calculation 10 into base address plus an offset address will form the adder so we have this adder unit and uh, code segment always is pointed by an instruction pointer that never changes the way how you ad ad address your program so your, all, your program is always pointed by IP that means SIDA SPBP can also be used as a general purpose set and uh, forming the physical address so these are 16 bits after addition we are going to get a 20 bits i'll go out i'll get the data and uh, i'll store it in a prefetch queue so there is a six byte prefetch queue where i can actually store in my 8086 uh, fetch data that that constitutes the bus interface unit of 8086 and then comes the execution unit after i fetch the data all the code part will go to the control system all the data will either go to the registers or ALU for execution so we have an ALU which takes in the data and brings out the output similarly the rest of the registers the general purpose AX, BX, CX, DX and stack 
uh, pointer registers and the index registers constitutes the for formation of your execution unit. So this is how the architecture is defined and the logical way of understanding the architecture would be all the registers related to the addresses are always in the bus interface part and this is the adder which generates address and storage of the data. Fetch part is always there in the BIU and the execute part is always there in the U. That involves the decoder, the ALU and the general purpose registers. And the results of ALU are always stored in somewhere called as flags. And the last set of register in the architectural part is uh, the flag register. Flag register is a 16-bit register which many of them are unused which are extended to your 80386, 486 and 586. So we will discuss what are the flags of 8086. So we have 6 status flags. Status flags reflects the status of the ALU. Suppose I did an addition. So it will reflect whether we got a carry or not. Same happens with the control flags. Control flags are where we actually control the flow of ALU. So let us uh, look at the way uh, the flag registers work. So O is an overflow flag. Overflow flag are, uh, ra is raised whenever there is an exception happened in an operation. So exceptions uh, like if at all I add a plus and a plus, we should result a positive number. But if you look at the uh, hexadecimal or the binary arithmetic, suppose I add a 48H and a 34H, let's say 44H, I end up having a result of 8CH. So 48H falls under a positive number in an 8-bit range, 44H also falls under a positive number in an 8-bit range. Whereas 8C falls under the negative range. So ideally, uh, why this happens is, in a binary number logic, we have, the numbers are cyclic. So after F, we end up with a zero. So we have a limited set of numbers. So whenever we have uh, n number of numbers, n by two will be positive and n by two will be negative. So when we look at a signed arithmetic, that is where whenever we have an MSB as one, it happened to be a negative number. So this will raise an exception called as an overflow. That doesn't mean overflow is an error. So if you look at a signed operation, maybe 48 plus 44 is not 8C. But if you look at an unsigned operation, 48 plus 44 is always 8C. So what overflow flag is telling me is, it is giving me a, uh, it is raising an exception to uh, as a warning, whether I have to figure it out and continue with the operation or no, it's wrong and I have to rectify it. So that is what a overflow flag does. Uh, sign flag. Sign flag will tell whether the value is positive or a negative. The, the best way to represent the flags uh, whenever you are writing an exam would be, so you will represent a sign flag. You have to represent what if it is 1 and what if it is 0. So sign flag 1, what is the operation? So 0 flag. So zero. Uh, let us take an example of a 0 flag. 0 flag 1 is, the result is 0. The result is not 0. So this is the best way to represent every flag. So if there are 6 flags, you uh, will have a heading of a flag. We can add a description about it and uh, explain it. Or maybe with an example. So maybe 23 plus 14. It is 37. What is the status of zero flag is? Zero flag will be zero. That will help me understand how the flags works. So whenever you are explaining about a flag, uh, you consider what is the name of the flag, the definition of the flag, and what is the reflection status, maybe with an example. AF is an auxiliary carry. Auxiliary carry is a carry which is generated after the fourth bit or enable. Carry flag is a carry generated after the arithmetic operation. So carry flag is not just for addition or subtraction. Carry can be a carry, carry can be a borrow or carry is what we get out of any shifted bit. Suppose I shift right or shift left. The shifted operations will discard the bit into your carry flag. Same happens with the 
parity flag. So these are the bunch of flag registers we have along with three control flags. Uh, what the, one of the control flag happened to be a direction flag which is used in string operations. So direction flag whenever it is zero the addresses keep on incrementing. Whenever it is one the addresses keeps on decrementing. So if the direction flag is zero, uh, zero, zero is the first address, the next address will be zero, one and so on. If the direction flag is one, the first address would be five, second address would be four, three and so on. So whether we have to auto increment or auto decrement depends on the way the direction flag points. Interrupt flag, interrupt flag one says it is enabled and zero says it is disabled. So interrupts can either be enabled or disabled and that is controlled by interrupt flag. And trap flag is the last flag which is used for debugging purpose. So how do you, uh, whenever you run a step by step program, the trap flag when enabled it will, uh, it will stop the execution and wait for whatever is write, written at that point of time. So earlier we have done with the architectural part of H086. So H086 will be covering three different aspects. One is the architectural part and other is the pin description and other is the programmer's model. So these three covers the whole uh, H086. Maybe in our syllabus point of view it covers the CO1 and CO2 of it. Architectural view is the outside view. So where uh, a user can understand how the processor is going to work. Pin diagram is how the processor uh, interacts with every component. And then the programmer's view is the uh, model where a programmer uh, like the instructions, the modes and etc. Maybe we will come to those. Let us start with the second part which is the architecture, uh, which is a pin diagram. So architecture told us the lot of features of 806. We, we came to know that there are 20 bit address bus, there is a 16 bit data bus and there is a control bus and lot of stuff in it. So all we have to do is, there is 8086 which is talking with a memory and an I.O. through a bus. That means whatever goes out of 8086 should be represented in the pin diagram. That means a memory or an I.O. if they want to talk with 8086 they have to be interfaced to this pin diagram. Interfacing is interconnection. Now let us see where all the buses would be. So. This is a diagram, uh, maybe there is no point of uh, remembering this diagram, but we need to know how each and every signal works. If we look at address bus, we have a 20 bit address bus. So we can see A0 to A14, A15 to A19. So A0 to A19 is your address bus. Similarly, the data bus would be zero, D0 to D15 because we have a 16 bit data bus. So which is again a combination of a to A15. That means A address bus is multiplexed with data bus on a single pin. So ideally address and data doesn't work at the same time. So we'll come to this in the later stage. And rest of the address bus pins, maybe 16, 17, 18, 19 are interfaced with the status pins. Uh, so, so far we have covered 20 different pins. We have a ground, we have a VCC. Uh, and we have a clock. So these are the common thing and a reset. These are all the common pins, 20-25 uh, different pins which are common that we have seen everywhere. Now the rest of the pins uh, actually define how the H086 is going to work. So one such pin is uh, BHE bar. So what a BHE bar? So bar usually says it's a uh, active low signal. In an active high signal, 1 is true, 0 is false. Whereas in an active low signal, 0 becomes true and 1 becomes false. That is the only thing that we uh, have to remember here. So BHE is a bus high enable. Ideally, the size of the data bus is 16 bits. But if you look at AX register, AX can be a 16 bit register or it can be used as an AL 8 bit register. Suppose I bring in an 8 bit of data. Using up the whole 16 bits of a uh, data bus is uh, ideally waste of resources and as well as a power. So what ideally we can do is whenever you are con uh, accessing only 8 bits of data, BHE bar will be uh, controlled. Let us say bus high enable. So if you want to use a 16 bit data bus, you have to put a 
zero. If you want to use the eight bit only of the database, it is one. So either true or false. So bus high enabled. So higher part of the bus is enabled if it is zero. Higher part of the bus is disabled if it is one. That is how we can figure out whether your uh, operation needs 8-bit data or a 16-bit data. So as you already know how each and every instruction works, maybe I'll, uh, I'll deal with a simple example. Suppose we are doing move AL comma SI. So ideally how much data we are trying to bring is a 8-bit data. So what will be BHE bar? BHE bar stays zero because we are accessing only 8 bits of the uh, 8 bits of the data bus. That's how this signal is uh, activating the bus. So how your instructions are transformed into signals is this. So we know that SA becomes an address. So which is going out with DS colon SA. So data segment is a base and this is offset. So into 10H plus offset address will generate a physical address and that physical address is 20 bits. So through where these 20 bits will go out? They go through A to A19. They go out, they go to the memory. And how much part of the data bus should be enabled? BHE bar is deciding based on ALO. This user is asking only 8 bits of data. Let us figure out BHE bar will be 0. So how much part of the bus will be working? Only the lower 8 bits. So how much data will be coming in? Only the 8 bits of data is coming in. And where is it getting stored? It is getting stored in AL. So how the instructions that you write in a program are converted to signals is taken care by the ALU and the control unit. So, that, so NMI and INDR are the interrupt pins. So if at all some device wants to uh, request for an interrupt, it requests through INTR. So as we discussed, the interrupt flag, whichever is, whenever it is enabled, INTR will work. Otherwise, INTR doesn't receive any interrupt. So that means they are disabled. There is one more pin called NMI. So NMI is a non-maskable interrupt. So non-maskable interrupt means uh, it cannot be disabled. So whenever uh, someone requests for an interrupt through NMI, it cannot be stopped. So this can be used for the high priority cases. So these will be the uh, the pins that are uh, that are commonly used for 8086. And uh, we have another pin called ready. So this is one important pin. Uh, ready is a pin used by the slower devices to tell uh, the acknowledge. Ideally, processor is the fastest element in the entire system. So someone requires the data or uh, someone sends in the data for processing and uh, maybe CPU is writing back to your memory. Uh, I'm transferring a burst of data, maybe 10 bytes or 100 bytes. So whenever I transfer some amount of data, the memories will be a bit slower than the way the processor will work. So what usually we have to do is we have to follow an acknowledgement. So when the data is completely transferred, then only the next batch of data is to be sent. So what the devices will do is, devices will send an acknowledgement through something called ready. So whenever a job is done, they'll give a signal called ready through which I'll understand that, okay, let me send the next data. So whenever is ready is one, the CPU will transfer the next batch and I'll re receive a ready. So who will send a ready is the devices. Devices will send to a CPU, maybe here 8086. And uh, test is another uh, pin that is used for the debugging part. And we have bunch of uh, status signals as well. So we have S3 and S4 signals which will indicate what type of segment we are using at that point of time. And we have discussed uh, there is one thing regarding the memory banks. So ideally 8086 will have two physical banks. One is called as an odd bank and other is a even bank. Odd bank is a stack of all the odd addresses and even bank is a stack of all the even addresses. So that is how your 16 bit bus is spread across. So 8 plus 8 bits will form a total 16 bits. So ideally whenever you are talking, uh, whenever you are requesting 8 bit data, you either get from the even bank or from the odd bank. Or whenever you are requesting a 16 bit data, we go to the two banks and get the data. So this is how your memory gets accessed. So how do you select the bank is through address pin. So the first address pin A0 will indicate whether you are going for an odd bank or a even bank. One will select the odd and zero will select the even bank uh, technical. And then comes the pins of the minimum mode and the maximum mode. 
So before uh, we go into the minimum mode and the maximum mode pins, we have to uh, understand how the system configuration actually works. A simple diagram uh, will help us understand how the system architecture works. Like you said, there is a 8086 processor, there will be a memory and there are IOS and they are interconnected using a bus. So we have an address bus, we have a data bus and we'll have a control bus. How these buses are controlled will, will, uh, will let us understand the way how these signals are represented. Like we have seen address bus 0 to 15 and data bus are mixed up. Similarly address bus 16 to 19. They come out of 8086. So this is a pin out and uh, they come out as a single line. End of the day they can either work as address or data like we discussed. So when do you figure out it works as an address or a data is there should be a division mechanism. It is done by something called TDM, time division multiplexing.